Mechanism of stream and line. Bu şey. two-dimensional array of DRAM cells uh, that are organized as rows and columns. And internally, we access a DRAM, uh, we access data inside DRAM in a DRAM program variety. And we do that by asserting something called the word line. And when we do this, uh, it basically connects DRAM cells down to a buffer structure, a buffer structure called pro buffer inside the RAM chip, through the lines. And this is how uh, what, what we have in a DRAM cell in a cartridge picture. So we, we have a capacitor where we store our data as a charge, as charge, and somewhat so. And we access to this uh, data through this access down system. And uh, we uh, we supply uh, energy to the circuitry, uh, uh, the, the, the like pretty much everywhere in the circuitry at the level of 1.2 volts called VDD uh, that will be re uh, relevant for this paper. And uh, what happens? Okay. So um, we have multiple charge leakage paths uh, within a DRAM cell. So DRAM is a volatile technology. It, it, it leaks charge over time and loses data. So to avoid that, we need to perform 
uh, operation calls refresh periodically uh, that restores the capacitor voltage for the time period called refresh window. Um, to access data in the DRAM row, we first need to activate this DRAM row to flash the rows containing to the row buffer. Uh, and this activation happens by asserting or putting high voltage to this uh, lane called Warbind. And we drive this lane uh, by using 2.5 volts uh, based on the DR4 standards. <clears throat> uh, once the row is activated and it is a row buffer, we perform all column accesses to read and write data. And also, uh, once we need to, uh, once we are done with this data and we want to access some other data, in some other role, we basically need to first perform an operation called pre-charge that connects these speed lines from the row and uh, so that uh, we prepare the whole summary for the next row activation. So there is a thing called draw hammer vulnerability in today's DRAM chips. Basically, uh, in this example, uh, let's say we want to access data in row 2. We basically first open the row two to access data, meaning that we have, uh, uh, apply some high voltage here. And then once we are done, we close the row. Basically, we uh, supply some low voltage here. And once we do this operation many times, we uh, observe bit flips in physically nearby rows that basically breaks uh, a fundamental principle called memory isolation. You do not access any data in row one and row three but you have bit flips now over there. So this is something bad. And once we uh, keep doing this many more times, then the, the amount of these bit flips and the, the amount of rows that observe these bit flips actually increases. So we call this row that we keep hammering, uh, activating and clo clo uh, recharging or opening and closing here, the aggressor row, and the other rows that are affected as we do those. Okay, so it's another cartoonish picture about how this row hammer works. So basically, uh, we have this aggressive row in the middle, and we have some victim rows, victim cells on the top and bottom. Uh, once we activate the row, we apply some high voltage to the sword line. And uh, here on the, like, another cartoonish figure here, uh, on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis we have the uh, word line voltage, voltage on the aggressive row's word line. So we activate it, and then the voltage goes up, and then we close it, it goes down, and then activate uh, or pre-charge, like, yeah, yeah, open, close again, and then uh, voltage goes up, down, and then up, down, and then we see it first. So this shows us that repeatedly toggling the voltage level of the word line actually is a key thing for user on the um, with this, I will start with my executive summary of this paper. So uh, the motivation is that repeatedly toggling this uh, DRAM rows worldwide voltage uh, is a key to cause the bit flips. And uh, this vulnerability worsens uh, with denser DRAM chips, so it's an important vulnerability. And understanding how raw hammer behaves is important to uh, provide effective and efficient solutions. So these are like three different motivations uh, that when they come together, it actually motivates this paper. And the problem is that no prior work demonstrates uh, how the level uh, of uh, volt, voltage that we put on the word line affects raw hammer. And our goal is to experimentally understand or show how uh, the word line voltage or VPP affects raw hammer and DRAM operation. And to this end, we conducted an experimental study on 272 DRAM chips from three major manufacturers. And uh, we have six observations showing that uh, when we reduce VPP, uh, we actually reduce the raw hammer vulnerability or the effects of raw hammer on the circuitry. Uh, so the bitter rate uh, reduces significantly. And to induce pistols, you need to activate a row more times than we did before. Um, so we also looked at how changing this VPP affects other things in the, in the, in the DRAM chip. So we also have nine additional observations on that. Uh, so we, we observed that uh, most of our tested DRAM chips just work fine when we reduce VPP. And we just don't change anything in the system and they go. For the erroneous chips, there's a small fraction. 
uh, we need we can still make them work by applying a longer row activation latency. Basically, when you activate the row, you need to wait for a longer time before you access the column. Uh, or when you uh, use similar refractive codes or double the refresh rate for a small fraction of rows, you can also uh, 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 initiate those networks. So the conclusion is that reducing our line voltage can be strong around the level without significant effect and reliable minimum operation. Okay, so another motivation. So this is our hammer, and uh, it's subtle. So I will look at the minimum activation count in just the first bit fillet uh, using raw hammer. Uh, we we have several different data points in the literature. So there is a paper in 2014 that uh, reports that you need to activate rows around like 137,000 times to induce bit fillers. And there is another work in 2020 that shows like in 4,000, a bit more than 4,000 activations, you can actually do the same. So from Less, in less than a decade, from 2014 to 2020, this uh, number reduced a lot. It's more than uh, an order of magnitude reduction. And this is an old one, actually, because this paper is like two years old. Uh, Nisa will show uh, some more updated uh, numbers as well. It's even less now. So uh, defenses are becoming prohibitively expensive because now we can hammer many more rows in a short amount of time. I mean, you need to perform many mitigator actions and uh, uh, they cost performance. Okay. Yeah. So to, to solve this problem, we basically need a deeper understanding. And the prior works already investigate several aspects of programmer that includes the effect of technology on scaling, temperature, access road, access road active time, or in a, a higher level term, you can talk about access patterns and the victim VRAM's physical location inside the VRAM chip. But uh, although we, I, I showed in, a bit earlier that repeatable toggling of our line voltage causes raw hammer, there is no reverse experimental study demonstrating the magnitude of uh, how, how the magnitude of our line voltage affects raw hammer vulnerability. Uh, our hypothesis is that when we reduce our line voltage, since these pulses are even like smaller, right? And uh, they will have, basically you, you have a rows in a, a weaker way. So we expect to uh, observe some reduction in raw hammer around the world. Uh, but at the same time, uh, reducing the warp line voltage, if you consider this uh, circuitry of like capacitor and access transistor, this will cause a weaker channel. Uh, in theory, and then uh, this can uh, hurt other you know, operation. And uh, uh, we expect that this will not be a significant effect. Um, okay, our goal is to understand the organ voltage effects on the hammer vulnerability and reliable you know, operation. And to this end, we came up with this experimental study where the scope of this camera is quite narrow. I need to be this here. Okay, so uh, this is our jump testing infrastructure that we have an FPGA board program with SoftMC. Now we call it Piran Mother, but it's a newer version available out there. Uh, it's open source. Uh, we have a DRAM module here, and we clamp two heater pads from like both sides and uh, just like squeeze them together here. And uh, these heater pads are uh, connected to this temperature controller that keeps the temperature stable here. And uh, we have an external power supply where we can actually manipulate the voltage level on the VPP power rail that goes to this DRAM chip. So this gives us fine grain control over the command side and where there's temperature on the voltage. Good. Yeah. Okay. So in our methodology, we want to characterize the worst case conditions. So to this end, we basically prevent sources of interference during our core test loop. To this end, we uh, disable all the RAM refresh operations, uh, disable calibration events, uh, and we do not uh, have any raw hammerization mechanisms uh, in this system. And we uh, fit all our tests into a small, uh, small time window that is smaller than the refresh window so that we don't have any video patch interference. 
and we repeat tests for 10 times. Uh, and we uh, have the worst case access cycles where we uh, repeatedly uh, access two physical adjacent roles as fast as possible. And these are the DRAM chips that we tested. Uh, we have uh, 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 272 uh, DR4 DRAM chips from three major manufacturers that implement different densities, die regions, organizations, so we have some diversity there. And there are many more uh, uh, details uh, about this state, uh, these tested modules in the full paper, and we have some experimental results as well, if you are curious about the absolute values. And we also show how we, uh, the, the whole methodology basically in a formal way uh, by uh, showing some algorithms. So the expand version is a little more okay. Okay, let's look at the results. Uh, so the first takeaway is that reducing more by voltage is low and vulnerability. So here on the x-axis we have lower band voltage. So this 2.5 volt is uh, the nominal voltage level, and from right to left we reduce lower band voltage. And on the y-axis we have the deteriorate. Uh, obviously, lower is better because we don't have uh, high deteriorate. Um, and here uh, the deteriorate is actually normalized to the bitter rate at uh, the nominal voltage of 2.5 volts. So we have multiple curves here. Each curve corresponds to this different VRAM module, and the shades around each curve uh, shows the variation across VRAM rows. And there's an obvious clear trend uh, that shows that as we go from right to left, as we reduce our long voltage, bitter rate reduces. Uh, so uh, we have less than uh, Even though, like in, in certain cases, there's some like opposite pattern, right? Uh, Right, so it, it, it sometimes goes above like one point zero, but this is in a very small fraction of the numbers. Uh, we do the same analysis across different modules in uh, all three ma major manufacturers. So here, manufacturer A is Micron, B is Samsung, and C is SA9X. And uh, you see like some different uh, dominant trends across different manufacturers, but in high level, we can say that. Yeah, when you use our lamp voltage, there's a tendency of like deteriorate use. So uh, we have another uh, metric that we can measure for hammer vulnerability, which is uh, what we will include here. So basically, it's minimum migration count to use the first bit of it. Again, uh, on the x axis, we have broad band voltage, and on the y axis, we have this metric, and it's also normalized to the nominal voltage. Okay, so again, we have uh, different curves for different DRAM modules, and uh, the variation across DRAM rows is shown by these shades. And uh, again, we see a, a, a dominant trend that is increasing as we reduce the overall voltage. Uh, so, what this curve tells us is that actually, basically, when we reduce our overall voltage, we need to activate rows more times to achieve the loops. And uh, again, there are some like points here that are contrary uh, to the dominant trend. Again, these are like quite small fraction of DRAM rows. And when we look at the data from all three manufacturers, uh, the trend is the same. So we have more analysis in the paper. I will not cover everything. So we look at the urban voltage effect on urban vulnerability. Uh, uh, in, in term, so we, we basically do some statistical analysis and look at the variation across different DRAM rows and manufacturers. And we observe that uh, the, bitter, the change in bitter rate varies a lot across rows and manufacturers. And uh, uh, similarly, the activation count to uh, industry first bit for the also varies across uh, rows and manufacturers a lot. Uh, so this is a full paper. You can check it for more details. Okay. So the second part of the analysis is the uh, uh, yeah okay so this is the takeaway of one right so this is just repeating the same uh, takeaway okay uh, so uh, in the first part we show that reducing more line voltage can reduce raw number vulnerability so what about other operations in DRAM uh, our, we have two takeaways from this study the first one is that. Most of the tested DRAM chips rely on operating using nominal timing parameters due to the built in safety margins, or uh, as we call them, guard bands. And also, uh, 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 for 
the remaining like small fraction of DRAM chips, we can make them reliable operators with small neural activation latency. And uh, so we basically do like two different analysis actions for one of them. The other one is that it's, it's showing that again, uh, with nominal refresh rate, uh, we, uh, we can reliably operate these most of the modules and a small fraction of them have either attention with Philips when we reduce world line voltage and to avoid that we can employ some singular correcting codes or double the refresh rate only for like 16% of strokes and the other so let's look at the data. Uh, again, on the x-axis, we reduce the line voltage. And on the y-axis, uh, I'm showing you the minimum raw activation latency, or as uh, we call it in the literature, TRC. So here again, uh, different curves correspond to different modules, and variation across rows are shown as shades. And uh, we observe that the raw activation latency increases as we reduce VPP. And this is something intuitive, right? Because this VPP actually drives the gate of the access transistor, and you have smaller um, uh, gate voltage that forms a weaker channel, and it, it needs more time to conduct the charge. Um, but there is this thing that uh, when you look at the data sheets of the DRAM chips, they actually recommend you to use this number, like 13.5 nanoseconds. Uh, to uh, for, for, for this TRCD parameter. So this is the nominal latency or timing constraint value. And uh, when you operate with this value, basically like whatever is under this level, it, it just works fine. Um, so that's why most of our VRAM chips complete raw activation before the nominal activation latency. And this is a general uh, trend across uh, modules from different manufacturers as well. And uh, we observed that 48 DRAM chips from Micron July the work with raw activation latency of 24 nanoseconds. It's a, so the nominal is like 13.5, right? Instead of 13.5, if you apply like 24 nanoseconds, meaning that you, you, you will access the data a little bit later, uh, you can make it reliable work. And 16 DRAM chips from Samsung, uh, these two points basically over there. Uh, uh, they can work with uh, an activation latency of 15 nanoseconds, so you don't have to actually increase it that much in Samsung case. And in Hynix case, uh, it's it's actually like you don't need to change anything. Everything is under nominal latency, so it just works. Okay, so to show like what's going on here in a bit more detail, we also conduct some spice simulations that uh, show some insights into our level of effects on the operation. Uh, so this is our circuit model and these are our parameters. So you can uh, repeat this analysis on your spice simulation if you want. And we use a two, two, two nanometer transistor model. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we perform a Monte Carlo analysis to account for the variation across different neuron chips. We introduce a variation of 5% for 10,000 iterations. Okay, so this is some results from the uh, raw activation process. So uh, here is like a little bit more background. So the raw activation completes on the, so, okay, maybe I should start with this. So on the x-axis, we have the time. So at zero, we send the activation command, and this is like, how the voltage changes. And on the y-axis, we have the voltage on the bit line. And uh, here, different colors correspond to different voltage levels. Um, and uh, this VTH is something important. It's called the threshold voltage level, basically. Uh, once your bit line voltage reaches this level, then uh, you can rely on the later in your cell amplifiers. If your voltage is below this level, then it's not reliable operation. Um, so uh, we observe that when we look at like different curves, like different look at different colors here, they cut this VTH level in different points in time, right? So this different voltage takes longer to reach VTH as we reduce for our voltage. And uh, this is because like 
we have this access transistor and resistor marble and voltage leads to a weaker channel in the access transistor and reduces the uh, sorry increases the time. So draw activation latency increases the resistor marble voltage. Okay, good. Uh, sometimes this doesn't work. So here, another piece of data from the spice simulation. So we look at the minimum reliable activation latency on the x-axis here. So it's basically a histogram. And we have a probability density function on the y-axis, right? So, uh, and different curves, again, correspond to different voltage levels for the world line voltage. And we observe that uh, for the nominal, so this is just like marking nominal uh, TRCV. 13 and a half milliseconds. And we observe that uh, the worst case TRCD when the PP is like 1.9 volts is still smaller than the nominal TRCD based on simulations. And uh, uh, this also tells us that the so if you if you operate at 2.5 volts, your worst case is around like 13 milliseconds. And if you reduce to 1.9 volts, then uh, your worst case is something between 13 and 13 and a half, right? So initially we had like 4.4% of guard bands or safety margin between the real value and the nominal uh, value that is specified by the specification. And uh, that guard band reduces to 1.5%. Uh, and the worst case latency increases from 12.9 to 13.3. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean that the spice simulation, like these numbers are not really important actually here, because uh, the spice simulation is just like simulating a very basic uh, model of Iran uh, circuitry that, you know, is not really realistic because we do not have information. It's like prior, uh, this is like some trade secret kind of information that, you know, the manufacturers do not share. So we just like have a, a best estimation uh, in our case. And uh, yeah, uh, but uh, based on this like analysis, we say that our spice simulation is also accurate with our observations. So we have more analysis in the paper where man what is effect on Iran's charge restoration process. And we show that uh, with reduced world man voltage, the capacitor voltage can saturate at a lower voltage level than the world man voltage series. And um, uh, also, the charge restriction latency can increase with reduced world man voltage, which is not surprising because it's a similar uh, process. Um, and this is a full paper. And let's look at the data retention. This is the last piece of the characterization chart. So, world man voltage effect on Iran refresh. So, here on the x axis, we have the refresh window. So, you need to, uh, if, if you remember from background, uh, I told you that you need to periodically refresh VRAM uh, cells so that they do not lose data, right? So here on the x-axis, at each point here, uh, so here, for example, we refresh rows every 64 milliseconds, here every 256 milliseconds, and then this is like one second, four seconds, 16 seconds, right? And on the y-axis, we look at the data retention meter rate. As we increase this refresh window, we refresh them less frequently, as a result, we get data retention results. And each curve here, again, corresponds to different voltage levels for the <coughs> voltage. Uh, and you see that this yellow one is 2.5 volts, which is nominal. Uh, if we go with this, then uh, our meter rate uh, follows this kind of curve. And uh, if you reduce it down to like 1.5 volts, you can see like the meter rate increases. So these curves are like quite distinct from each other. Uh, so the retention meter rate increases in normal voltage very uh, But uh, the, the good thing is that for most of the DRAM chips, they do not observe any bit fillers actually uh, at 64 millisecond time uh, refresh rate we go. So this is the normal refresh rate. And if you just apply this, you're okay. And uh, this is the case for all the uh, modules from all three manufacturers that we test. And we also look at the, so for, now we, we look at like the main uh, chips here, like right? this 216 works. Now we look at the main and how the emitter rates, uh, sorry, how the emitters uh, uh, vary across uh, different 64 bit words. And we observe that there are no 64 bit words with more than one bit word. So this is the data word. 
And if you apply ECC, the most simple ECC, singular correcting code, is capable of uh, correcting one bit filler in a 64 bit data world. So uh, it will correct everything. So now we look at like how this erroneous uh, data works uh, uh, are distributed across different rows. So on the x-axis, we have a number of 64-bit data works with one bit code, so it's the like number of uh, erroneous data works. On the y-axis, we have a fraction of data works. So essentially, we are looking at, again, some sort of histogram where like we, uh, we, we look at like uh, if these like erroneous uh, data words are accumulated in some rows or they are like distributed across them and things like that. And we observe that a small fraction of DRAM rows contain these erroneous words. So uh, if you just focus on these rows, like if, if you apply singular referencing code, you will apply to every primary. But uh, there is also an alternative. You can just focus on these rows that contain the erroneous words. And you can just double the refresh rate for those, for example. And then you will get a much better picture. Uh, okay. So basically, you can apply singular referring code or double the refresh rate for the 16.4 percent of the VRAM rows, and you can uh, get away with that. In conclusion, we provide the first row characterization of the reduced word RAM voltage, and uh, we present results from 272 real VRAM chips that shows that we can reduce row RAM vulnerability with reduced word RAM voltage. And uh, this comes at the cost of increasing the row activation latency and uh, reducing the data retention time. However, uh, the current nominal numbers and specifications already implement large safety margins, and we can just use those uh, without changing it in the system, and uh, we will be mostly okay. Okay, so it doesn't significantly affect the reliability of operation data, so I'm like, but it's not significant. Okay, so this is a presentation of the paper. I can get some questions at this point if there are any. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question regarding different manufacturers. I mean, we can see that um, different manufacturers perform differently well regarding the reduced uh, world type voltage, right? Yeah. What is the key reason behind this? Just an idea, because I'm just curious in how they structure from here. So yeah, it's hard to say actually. Like we don't we don't know for sure. Uh, but basically, so uh, I, I mentioned specifications a lot, right? Uh, so there's a reason behind it. So there's this uh, consortium called JDAC. They uh, they it's it's basically a consortium of like different data manufacturers and some processor manufacturers, some like big tech companies. They have a say on the table and they agree on some certain like. Uh, uh, parameters or uh, requirements. And uh, they say that like with 2.5 volts of VPP, your chip should work. And everybody agrees on that. And as long as that criteria is satisfied, then uh, the manufacturer is like free to do whatever they want inside the VRAM chip. So there can be some different design decisions, different organizations of the chips, or like uh, different power delivery circuitry. So for like uh, driving these like word lines with this high voltage, uh, they basically implement some uh, circuitry inside the chip called charge pumps. They offer a lot of charge and then just like boost it to the word line uh, at once. And uh, like it's completely like out of the specification or the like limitations by that consortium, right? So. They can implement other words. They can be like strong or weak from each other, you know. So there can be those kind of uh, differences, and there's always a factor of like a manufacturing process variation as well. So when you just like tape out your chip, uh, not every part of the wafer is equally reliable. So uh, it also changes from like you know your, you can implement like different technologies in your manufacturing process. And uh, it can also have some aspect of that. So, um, the way that you're driving what line voltage by changing the entire system to VPP, how is it? Because so we call it VPP. Actually, the specification calls it VPP because there are like two different power rates. One of them is VDD, the other one is VPP. VPP is exclusively exclusive for world line uh, voltage, and VDD is for the rest of the system. I see. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, because I was wondering if you, because I was kind of confused because when I designed uh, chips in the past, um, the role selector put it up straight to the system in the time of So I thought like, um, when you change the DVD, you might, when you change the word line, you're changing the entire DVD, so I was a bit confused. Ah, yeah, but now they are separate from the DR4. Like in, in DR3, it was like that. Uh, you, you only have like a VDD and then VPP is internally generated and you cannot manipulate it. So, yeah. Okay, I'll just go with the analysis now. Uh, I hope like, I basically this was like, a, I guess, just to, you know, have some paper here for analysis. You just like show this paper. And uh, now it's more relevant to the course structure, I guess. So, uh, what we expect you to do is to come up with like a critical analysis, right? And it starts with like understanding the paper well, of course. And uh, you need to come up with a list of strengths of the paper. So what can, what could be the strengths here? So this is the first reverse experimental characterization of raw hammer sensitivity to the worldwide voltage. So it's a clear contribution, right? Because it's the first that does that. So this is strength. Um, so the paper in this case, Several potential uh, effects of reducing raw hammer, which is not just like focused on raw, raw hammer, but it also looks at the like viable genome operation. So it's also something good about the paper. Um, and in the paper, there is a clear hypothesis. Like, I, of course, like we didn't read the paper together here, but if you look at the PDF, like in the first page, there's a clear hypothesis. And that hypothesis is tested throughout the paper. And uh, there is some strong supporting evidence that supports that hypothesis. And uh, I can't say that it's a well-written paper because it's my paper. Uh, you can argue uh, that, I don't know, <laughs> you might not agree with me, but yeah, I think, it, I believe that it's a well-written paper, but it's really a subjective comment anyway, so uh, in your analysis as well, it's like your opinion. Um, so you can maybe count other strengths as well, but I just want to get this to be clear. Um, it's, it's better to have more because these are important for like discussion points. Uh, and let's look at the weaknesses. Uh, so first thing is like, uh, no paper is perfect, right? Every paper has weaknesses. So don't hesitate like pointing out the weaknesses, you know, just because there are papers. So uh, yeah, this is my paper and it has a, a major weakness of like, the practical benefit of the study is not really clear. Uh, even though like there's this experimental work, there's some support in evidence from spice simulations. The hypothesis makes sense, everything checks out. But the reduction in disturbance vulnerability is quite limited when you look at the numbers. It's like, um, yeah, on average, we can increase the activation count threshold by like four person, five person, something like that. And in some like corner cases, we uh, observe some increase of like up to like 80 something percent, but it's not like, 10x increase, right? So it's it's clear like reducing raw hammer voltage clearly doesn't solve raw hammer by itself. So it has that intrinsic limitation. And uh, it's, it's not clear just by looking at this paper like how uh, we can actually make use of this observation. And there's no mention of a clear mechanism that leverages this as well. So uh, in that sense, you can call this paper as like not really complete because, uh, so the hypothesis is there, experimental data is there, and like, it doesn't turn out to be a, you know, useful product at the end. Like, it doesn't have to be a product, but something useful, you know? Um, and not all papers have to be like that anyway, because some problems are like bigger than what you can fit into like 11, 12 page paper. So for this paper, like we have like quite a lot of material that fills up all these pages and they are all necessary. So this part basically was out of scope for this paper. Um, so the authors sweep only the word line voltage, but not other voltage levels. And uh, there are some uh, explanations about that in the paper. Basically, we were limited by the what infrastructure we had. Uh, we couldn't make it work reliably by certain um, uh, Okay, temperature dependency is not reverse analyzed because we can sweep like 
So you see your word line voltage for like different data points. You have many chips to test and you can check, test like a few different temperature levels. But if you want to like go really reverse, you need to like test every word line voltage at every temperature level. Also, you need to test all rows and you need to find the worst case for every single data and stuff. So uh, when you want to go reverse, like it's, it's like there's no answer for that. And it, it really takes a lot of time. And to make a, to execute a project like in a limited amount of time, you basically need to sacrifice some of these. So here, this paper sacrifices temperature and uh, testing all of this, it samples a few thousands of those. And uh, yeah, I'm not proud of this. Figures are a bit too small. It's really hard to read some of them. Uh, and authors test DDR4 chips, but the state of the art is DDR5 today. And it was, I guess, not back then. Like DDR5 was very recent. Uh, but today, I guess, like, we can still say that it's quite recent because, like, there are no FPGA boards that actually we can plug in DDR5 chips and uh, program with DRAM bundle to you know, test DDR5 chips. So it's really has some infrastructure limitation. Um, later on, we expect some takeaways. So these are the two takeaways that I got from this paper. Rohan phenomenon is indeed related with the magnitude of the word line voltage. And reducing word line voltage reduces Rohan vulnerability at the expense of increasing memory access latency and reducing the data retention time, which in turn comes back to us at an increased refresh rate. Okay, so these are some standard things. Uh, and then uh, we expect you to be a little more creative in the discussion things. So over the years, we offered this class like many times. And we always like keep seeing some discussion points like, what do you think about changing the robot models? So the student comes here, presents all these great weaknesses, great strengths, a rigorous job like looking at other papers in the literature, understanding what is the position of this paper, what is the contribution of this paper compared to the whole relevant literature. Like they do a really good work on that. And then when it comes to discussion points, okay, yeah, what do you think about that? What should I think about Warline Maltes? We already talked about Warline Maltes for like half an hour, right? Four or five minutes. Okay. Uh, so what other parameters can we play with? So there are trillions, gazillions of parameters, right? So what, what are you talking about? Basically, uh, the reviewer should be a little bit more specific here. Like, uh, this can be a valid question, but basically like they, they need to pinpoint, okay, what about this parameter? And also, why is that parameter interesting? You know, there should be some motivation as well. And if, if possible, some insights as well. So what other sensitivities of raw hammer are interested to investigate? It's again like open-ended question that, you know, I mean, let, let me ask this question to you, you know, can you think of anything? I guess, I don't know, any ideas? So this is not good, right? Because there's no discussion. I'm just like making a monologue here. Um, how does changing voltage affect system reliability, which is already explained in the paper. And uh, you, can, you can argue back saying that, oh, the paper only looks at the memory access latency and the refresh rate, but there can be some other effects of that as well. But you need to be like a bit more specific about what could be those effects, right? Because like, so basically uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, when you present a paper, uh, I guess now you're like, the tables are turned and now you, you, you can uh, relate more with what I'm going to say. So probably before coming to like to read this paper, right? And uh, I just like explain this paper and you, you just like learn about uh, a bunch of new concepts and some data bombarded here. Uh, and uh, uh, I shouldn't expect you to, you know, uh, digest everything like at the second that you learn about it and then start critically thinking and being creative about that, you know? I need to guide your thoughts to some direction so that uh, we can have a, a lively discussion here. And 
Yeah, what about the memory table? This is always like a, a question you can put, right? It's, it's like a freebie. Yeah, we talk about, you know, what about a strong? What about flash? Okay. What about that? So you can just like list all these like bad discussion points. These are really easy to come up with. I just came up with this list in like three minutes, I guess. And it doesn't go somewhere. So uh, this is just like, uh, I'm, I'm not claiming that I can come up with very good discussion points, but I do my best. And uh, this is the, this, this is some like uh, tips I can give you, like what I apply basically. So basically you need to read carefully and find the weaknesses between the lines of the paper. Papers are written in a way that they will hide the weaknesses, right? So you need to be like, go into details, with picky and then find those weaknesses. And those are the starting points, for, starting points for two discussion points usually. So you need to critically think about all these weaknesses. Are those fundamental weaknesses, intrinsic weaknesses, or are they just like artifacts of like some bad execution of the project? Or I don't know, maybe bad engineering, maybe the student is lazy, that's why the weaknesses are there. So if you can point them, then, then you can ask questions like, how can I make it better, right? And uh, if those are some fundamental or intrinsic weaknesses, then uh, maybe there's not much you can do about them. Uh, so yeah, this is another point that I, I discussed a little bit earlier, right? Is the paper absolutely complete? Why not more impactful? How to make it greater? Like, what is, what is, what is next? Like, what is the missing point? So the, the first weakness was actually, the first weakness was actually looking at that, right? So what about it? Like, okay, I learned about this. How is it useful? Uh, so what is the limitation of this paper again? So you can find in many papers that a section called limitations. So it's a good starting point. There are also like here and there, some small sentences, sometimes in the footnotes, sometimes in, uh, I don't know, appendices, like somewhere like the reader usually do, do not look first. And they say that we live blah, blah, blah to future work. Blah, blah, blah is out of this paper scope. So these are good uh, starting points, you know, for good discussion points. And uh, you don't have to do everything by yourself. So this is a quote from Isaac Newton, right? So you need to basically stand on the shoulders of giants, and this is how we do that. Uh, okay. Yeah, get help from the literature. So how can you get help from the literature for creating some discussion points? So you basically put the name of the paper here, in Google Scholar, and then you have the results, right? So you. So here we have like two versions of the same paper uh, and some other relevant paper from Professor Mutlu and then there will be some other paper like the latest here. You can go through that list or you can just like look at this particular thing. Google Scholar already does this analysis and then says that, okay, so there's three other papers already submitted side of this paper. So they should be saying something about this paper, right? So some of them will just say like, Oh, there are like a lot of works in the literature that does Rohammer characterization and then a huge citation below that. This is one of them. So probably you will not get much from there. But uh, in some papers, especially if you choose like a mechanism kind of paper instead of a uh, characterization kind of paper, uh, you will see like the, the, the follow ups, the newer mechanism papers will actually pinpoint the weaknesses of the previous paper so that they can make a strong claim for their contribution, right? So basically in the literature, probably there are some authors who spent like days, weeks, months to find those weaknesses and then write, they already wrote them in their papers. So just get help from them. Okay. So uh, I have two examples of discussion points. So this is something I showed you like several times. Uh, in the in the case on the left hand side, we have the word line with some high voltage, which is red, and we have a strong channel here between the capacitor and the line. And when we reduce the word line voltage, uh, the channel gets weaker. So let's let's look into this a little bit more. Let's look into the like circuit level that we did not discuss in the paper. 
the channel's conductance is determined by voltage between the gate and the source of the access transistor, right? So access transistor is basically an MOS transistor. And if you, I'm not sure if you learned about this in your undergrad program, uh, some CS tools do not, uh, but I guess it's something like quite simple. You can just read about it as well. So basically here on the x-axis, we have the voltage difference between the, so this is a MOS transistor, right? So this is the gate, this is source, this is drain. And uh, once you apply high voltage to gate, uh, you conduct this drain and source to each other so that the electron flows. Um, so if you increase VGS, then the amount of current here increases, so that they, they, it conducts better, basically, when you have a better voltage difference between the gate and the source. And how is it relevant here? So gate voltage is VPP, and source voltage is VDP, right? So in this sense, reducing VPP, while VDD is constant, reduces VGS, right? So, uh, so this is exactly what we do in this paper. We reduce VPP, we do not change VDD, and as a, as a result, the gate to source voltage difference reduces, and it causes some weaker conductance between drain and source. So this is a problem here. And this is why our access latency is increasing. So, reducing VPP while we this constant reduce VGS. Reduce VGS can lead to a weaker channel. And why not reduce VPP and VDD together? Right? If you also reduce VDD, then we can maybe have a larger VGS and it would conduct better. So, would that work? Does it make sense to you? So what would be the benefit of that? I guess it would reduce the access latency. What do you think? Like, does that make sense to you? Or am I missing something here? Uh, reduce the raw number vulnerability uh, can have smaller effect on access. Are you right. going to see something? Will it also affect like, other parts, like, for instance, your send amplifiers, like, which is also connected to VDD? Yes. So, that could cause latency in itself, right? Yes, exactly. So, therefore, what you say in your memory access by a word line to a bit line is based on your sensor device not being able to lock up to VDD or zero. So, maybe inside the DRAM array, I will save some latency, but in the like periphery circuitry, IO circuitry, maybe I need to run it to the smaller clock side, the clock rate, right? And uh, as you said, like in, in sense amplifiers, basically the sense amplifiers are like two inverters connected back to back, and they are like SRM cells. And uh, it's like, uh, yeah, the, they basically work faster if you apply a higher voltage. There. So there's a trade off here. And it can be interesting to understand like what that trade off shows us, right? Maybe we can find a better pair to optimal point in our design space. Uh, Okay. Ah, we already talked about. Ah, okay. So, a potential shortcoming, another one than what you said, is that when we reduce VDD, now we put less charge on the capacitor because capac capacitors, like if you remember, the charge in the capacitor is like Q, is like the uh, voltage times the capacitance, right? So, the capacitance is based on the physical properties of the capacitor, it doesn't change. You reduce voltage, you put less charge. So when you put less charge, then uh, with like that, that charge will, will last shorter in the DRAM cell because it's volatile, it will leak out, and you will, you might need like uh, a higher refresh rate. So this can also come at uh, uh, performance and energy cost. So why is it not done in this paper? So the paper basically justifies not exploring this by saying that this is our infrastructure limitation. So we basically tried to reduce VDD and our chips didn't work reliably. Even when we did not try, I, I, sorry. So how we try the uh, change in voltage is that we hack some part of the power delivery uh, uh, rail over there and then we apply some power from like external power supply. And even when we apply the nominal VDD, our chips didn't work. 
So there are some signal integrity issue, I guess. We do not really know like what's going on. But with our infrastructure, it was hard to reduce UDV and clean with us. Uh, so what kind of infrastructure can provide us with such capability? Basically, we need something, you know, uh, some port that officially uh, supports that, you know, you can play with VDB here. Uh, in our RPG boards, uh, it was not there. But maybe, like, you know, this overclocking community in uh, gaming and stuff, they, they use specific motherboards that are, uh, provides you with, like, some control of water so you can overclock. But maybe it can work other way as well. So maybe we can explore some BIOS options. Uh, you know, we can discuss this, uh, or we can talk about custom test platforms, if it makes sense to invest on this. These are some discussion points that we can come up with. So I'm not saying that this is like the best discussion point you can come up with, but uh, it's, it's, I guess it's much better than the, than the ones here. So basically, I elaborate on the second point that what other parameters can play with, can play with VDB. But uh, like, I, I did it by like giving some background about like why VDB is important, what kind of effect it can have. So you have a better idea, like you know, uh, what to discuss about. I just wanted to you know. Uh, I like this a little bit. So another discussion point, how to leverage short number sensitive to voltage. So the mechanism was missing, right? What can we do about that? So we can, so we have this key insight in the literature. If you read like a bunch of papers that are relevant to this paper, you will come up with this uh, Hassan Hassan's paper called Charge Cash. And uh, over there actually it's shown that uh, when you, if you if you keep activating row uh, like without like waiting too much between activations, the the it's very really intuitive actually. The row does not leak much charge out, so it has some like good charge level inside it. So maybe you need to uh, you don't need to like wait long right? for a long time for like uh, the sense of fire to sense everything, or maybe uh, for those hot rows. Maybe the data retention time is not really issued. Maybe you don't have to uh, issue a refresh command uh, targeting them, right? Uh, so maybe they can be like less frequent for refresh and they can be okay and they have short access latency. So what if instead of reducing VPP for the whole chip, if you exclusively uh, reduce this VPP for those hot drops, now the problem is reduced to like how to detect those hot drops. And there are some works that actually uh, uh, focus on like how to identify which rows are being hammered. So the comet will be one of them, but uh, also like for indie RAM uh, uh, mechanisms, there is this like DRAM sec paper from 2021 that shows like how you can track the row activation counts in high accuracy. Uh, you can implement a mechanism like that. You can play with the charge pumps, and uh, 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 you can uh, find some mechanisms, basically. But uh, there's also another concern here that uh, what if our charge pumps are not really like uh, when, we, when we switch from one P VPP to another VPP level, uh, it will require some settling time, right? And what if that settling time is too long and uh, it's like, it's too long for basically like activating rows. Maybe, maybe it's happening more frequently than this. So then it doesn't make sense. So these are things to look at. And there can be some potential benefits. So we observe up to 85% increase in row hammer threshold by reducing VPP. And when we do this, uh, like when we actually like come up with a mechanism that does this, maybe we can get use of this Depends from this 85% a little bit more. And uh, we can perform less frequent ground refresh operations that will give us like, uh, uh, we will gain back some of the performance overhead. 
And uh, yeah, it's all that's more about from sort of. Yeah. With this, I'm done. But yeah, discussion points as well. So thank you for bearing with me for all this time for one hour. Other, two more. How long are you going to take? Yeah. Should we do it? Thanks, guys. Mostly out of focus. <laughs> This is fun here, actually. Like, it's not too far from the camera. The, the length, not the wide. So Maybe it is should be the... Can you disable the tracking? I don't know how. Not sure where to just go wherever is easier for you and then we can stick in. Okay, I also need <laughs> the clicker there. Yeah. I think we can start when you're ready. Okay. So Brian gave an excellent talk and some tips to how to uh, prepare for your presentation. And now I'm, I will uh, share the screen. Oh, okay. it's not sure. Uh, it's not sure. Yes. Let's see. Sorry. See, in your presentation, you should do that. Okay. Now let's get started. So, hi everyone, I'm Nisa and today I'll talk about our recent work comment, company sketch based drop tracking to mitigate draw hammer at all costs. This work was uh, in HPC this year, it's a fairly recent one, and I'm looking forward for your feedback and discussion. <laughs> okay, let's get started with the executive summary. Yes. As DRAM becomes more vulnerable to read disturbance, existing road time mitigation techniques either prevent it first at low performance cost but with high area overheads, or at low area cost but with relatively large performance and energy overheads. So our goal is to prevent road time mitigation with low area performance and energy overheads behind the road time vulnerable DRAM based systems. Our key idea is to use low cost and scalable hash based counters to accurately track DRAM of activations. To this end, we propose comments. Comet tracks most DRAM rows with scalable hash based counters by employing the company sketch technique to achieve a low area cost. And it tracks only a small set of DRAM rows with high accurate that are activated main times with high accurate per DRAM row activation counters to reduce the performance penalty. Our comprehensive evaluations show that Comet achieves a good trade off between area, performance, and energy cost by increasing significantly less area overhead and outperforming the state of the art mitigation technique. And Comet is open source and act like evaluated, and you can check our GitHub repo and see our source code and online data. So this is the outline of my talk. Let's continue with the background and the problem. So today's DRAM chips are vulnerable to read disturbance where repeatedly opening and closing or activating and precharging the same DRAM or results in bit flips in nearby DRAM cells, which we call the roll hammer bit flips. And we refer the DRAM rows uh, DRAM row that is activated as the aggressor row, and the DRAM rows uh, with the bit flips are called victim rows. And we call the minimum number of activations that causes a bit flip the row hammer threshold. So DRAM chips are becoming more and more vulnerable to read disturbance today. And read disturbance bit flips occur at much lower activation counts. And these two recent works show that, show, uh, show that the row hammer threshold has reduced more than two orders of magnitude in less than a day. 
So this is exactly why mitigation techniques against weak disturbance attacks uh, need to be effective and efficient uh, in highly low hammer-vulnerable VRM based systems. One approach to mitigate draw hammer is to preventively replace victim rolls before pit stops occur. However, doing so requires uh, tracking VRM or activation counts of aggressive rolls to identify and preventively refresh potential victim rolls. Let's look at an overview of preventive refresh uh, based mitigation techniques uh, that track VRAM or activations. The first approach allocates one activation counter per DRAM row and uh, basically tracks these activation counts with 100% accuracy. The mitigations based on this approach uh, have very low performance and energy costs because these are highly accurate, 100% accurate. However, these mitigations incur very high area costs uh, simply because we have many DRAM rows in today's DRAM devices and these mitigations need to implement a lot of counters. And the second approach uh, utilizes this observation that an attacker can only hammer a small subset of DRAM rows as opposed to uh, all rows before DRAM rows are being refreshed. So this approach allocates one activation counter per aggressive row. So this effectively reduces the uh, number of counters that are uh, implemented in the system. And since these counters are still allocated per uh, DRAM row, the mitigations that use this approach have low performance and energy costs. However, uh, they also have high area costs because uh, especially at low row hammer thresholds, the number of aggressive rows increases significantly. And since now we are uh, mapping these counters to specific DRAM rows, we need to store some tags and search some tags. And this is why these are implemented with content addressable memory, which are expensive hardware structures. And the last approach allocates less than one counter per DRAM row, either by introducing shared counters that track many DRAM rows with each counter, or by introducing probabilistic preventive refreshes. So this effectively reduces the number of counters implemented in the system, and therefore the mitigations based on this approach have a low area cost. However, uh, they incur high performance and energy costs, especially at lower performance thresholds, because they use the DRAM bandwidth, useful DRAM bandwidth, to do preventive actions, and they consume uh, basically a high portion of it instead of doing useful memory requests. And ideally, we would like to achieve low energy uh, overhead, low processor chip and DRAM overhead, and low performance overhead. And as you can see from this radar chart, None of the existing mitigation techniques prevent straw hammer at low per, uh, area performance and energy costs at the same time. So our goal is to prevent straw hammer bit flips with low area performance and energy overheads in high low hammer vulnerable VR based systems. You observe that there are two types of counters that can be used to track the annual activations. The first one is cash based counters, which are low cost, and the second one is tag based counters that are high acre. And we want to get the best of both worlds. And now uh, let me explain how these uh, different types of counters work. So hash based counters map these DRAM rows to a fixed uh, set of counters by using cache functions. So they take the row ID as an input and uh, they give the uh, row ID as an input to the hash function and use the output as an index for the counter, uh, basically backing each DRAM row to different counters. So this gives us two main advantages. The first one is that that makes hash based counters implementable with low cost structures because this enables mapping without tags. And second, uh, hash based counters can aggregate many rows, activation counts together and represent them uh, with a fixed number of counters. And that makes them low cost. But, but since we have a fixed number of counters, that means that some of the DRAM rows are map to the same counter. So this introduces the problem of, uh, basically this introduces an inaccuracy. So let's say that we have an activation to row zero. Uh, that means that we will increment the activation count for row four as well. And tag-based counters are uh, good in this case because each of these uh, tag-based counters track, tracks only one uh, DRAM of activation count and they are highly accurate. So what we would like to do is basically get both, uh, both sides advantages and combine them in a mechanism. So our key idea is to use uh, low cost and scalable hash-based counters to track most DRAM rows activations with low rate overhead 
and use high data type based counters to check only a small set of DDAM rows to achieve low performance over time. And to this end, we propose Comet. Comet has two key structures. Uh, the first one is the counter table, which maps each DRAM row to a group of counters, uh, to a group of low, low cost hash based counters as uniquely as possible uh, by employing the count sketch technique, which I will be talking about in a minute. And it triggers the preventive refresh to an aggressor row's victim rows when the aggressor's counter group reaches a predetermined threshold. Counter table tracks DRAM of activations at low cost. And the second structure is the recent aggressor table that allocates highly accurate tag based for DRAM or counters for only a small set of DRAM rows that are activated many times. And by doing so, it reduces the performance penalty by increasing the correct accuracy. Let's look at a high level summary of how Comet operates. When there is an activation to row A, Comet first checks the counter table, which implements hash based counters and gets an estimation based on the counter table. And at the same time, it checks the recent aggressive table, which has the tag based counters and gets the second estimation based on that. And when there is a tag match in the recent aggressive table, Comet uses that estimation because tag based counters uh, are more accurate. And using this estimation, uh, Comet compares this estimation to a preventive refresh threshold. And if that estimation reaches the threshold, it preventively refreshes row eight victim rows. Let's look into more detail. Uh, to, let's look into the counter table in more detail. So the counter table uses counter sketch technique, which is a hash based frequent item counting technique that uses hash functions, multiple hash functions, and uh, an array of counters per hash function. So let's say that we have an activation to row A. Uh, the counter table first gets the output of the hash function using row ID as an input, and basically uses that output as an index to the uh, counter array and increments that count. Then we have another activation to the same row. Uh, the hash function will result in the same uh, index, and then the counter table will increment the same count. Then we have an activation to another row. Um, Ideally, the hash function will output a different value, which will uh, map this DRAM row to a different counter, and the counter table will implement that. Since we have a fixed number of counters, uh, in this example, an activation to row C results in incrementing the same counter as row A. So uh, this is what we call a counter collision. These counter collisions cause overestimations because if we were to estimate the activation count of A, we would estimate it as 3 because that's the counter value. But the actual activation count of A is 2. To reduce these overestimations and counter collisions, a uh, counter table implements multiple hash functions different than each other and basically uses different counter arrays for each of them. So this results in as unique as possible counter groups for different DRAM rows. And uh, when a when a DRAM row is activated, all of these counters are incremented at the same time, uh, making the minimum counter value across these counters an upper bound of the actual activation count. And the counter table uh, uses the minimum counter value as its estimation. And in this example, uh, this counter group of A, the minimum value of counter group of A is 2. And this is why it will be estimated the actual. Uh, yeah. Activation count will be estimated as two, which is the same as the actual activation count. And Comet sets the preventive refresh threshold to timely refresh an aggressive row's victim rows to prevent bit flips. Uh, in here, we have an activation to row A, and we see that all the counters in the counter table reached the threshold. That means that we will estimate the act activation count as the threshold value, and Comet will identify A as an aggressive row and preventive refresh A's victim rows. Since now we preventively refreshed A's victim rows, what we would like to do ideally is to reset the counters that we have. However, if we do so, this would result in um, resetting uh, some of the shared counters, right? So this will disturb the counter group of C, resulting in, would be resulting in estimating activation count of C as zero. However, to avoid this, uh, Comet does not reset any counter in the counter table after preventive refreshes. So this creates some problems, right? So after preventive refresh in victim rows, the actual activation count becomes zero. However, the counters in the counter table saturate at the threshold value. When we have another activation to row A, the estimation would stay at the threshold value. 
causing another preventive refresh, and this can potentially incur performance and energy cuts. However, if we knew that we already prevented refresh A's victim roles, uh, we could have avoided that. And the recent aggressive table does exactly that. So it allocates per DRAM row uh, activation counters for aggressive roles to accurately estimate their activation counts after preventive refreshes. So after identifying A as an aggressive role and preventive refresh victim roles, uh, Comet allocates the recent aggressive table entry and initializes the counter with zero. And after this point, whenever A is activated, uh, there will be a tag match, and Comet will estimate the actual activation count as the actual uh, activation count of it, because these counters are not shared across different DRAM rows. Uh, Comet implements this for only a small sort of DRAM rows to maintain the low area cost. And this was the high level summary of how Comet operates. We have more operational details for Comet, including counter update policy, periodic counter reset mechanism, recent target to table uh, eviction policy, and other more details. So you can check our paper for those. Let's move on to the evaluation. So we evaluate performance and energy consumption uh, with cycle level simulations using Remulator and Beyond Power. These are the system configurations that we use and uh, Comet's configuration are listed over there. Uh, we compare Comet against four state of the art 1200 mitigations across many single core and most core workloads. And you can access all that from this link. We evaluate the storage and area overhead uh, using type by and here is the comparison against graphene and hydra uh, for two different raw hammer thresholds. So this is the area overhead of Comet. As you can see, Comet's area overhead reduces as the raw hammer threshold decreases. This is because Comet stores fewer bits for its counters as raw hammer threshold decreases. Uh, this is the area overhead of graphene, and as you can see, Comet, significant, Comet has significantly less area overhead compared to graphene. And this is the area overhead of Hydra, which is pretty similar to Comet's area overhead. And we conclude that Comet increases significantly less area overhead than graphene, and a similar area overhead to Hydra. Let's look at the performance and DM energy uh, analysis of Comet. So we evaluate the average performance and DM energy overheads of Comet across simplified applications, and these are the performance results uh, normalized to a system with no row hammer mitigation across different row hammer thresholds. And as the row hammer threshold decreases, Comet increases small performance overhead. This is because it uh, issues preventive refreshes as opposed to the baseline with no mitigation. And uh, this is the uh, DRAM energy results, uh, normalized to the same baseline, and the results are similar. And we conclude that Comet prevents bit first with very small average performance and DRAM energy overheads compared to the baseline. Let's look at the performance comparison of Comet against four state of the art mitigation techniques for single core applications. This, these are the results for uh, the raw hermit threshold of 1000. And as the raw hermit threshold decreases, all mitigations incur more performance overheads because all of them start to send preventive refreshes. And that has a performance overhead. And we have three key observations. The first one is that uh, Comet outperformed all low area cost mitigations starting from raw hermit threshold of 500. Uh, it incurs a small performance overhead over graphene and outperforms high drop at all raw hermit thresholds. And these are the results for multi core workloads and uh, for different drone kind of thresholds. As you can see, performance overheads a bit, are a bit higher for all uh, mediation techniques, and trends are very similar to single core application evaluation trends. And let's look at the DRAM energy com uh, comparison uh, across single core applications. So these are the results for all raw hammer thresholds that we tested. And again, Comet consumes less DM energy than all low area cost uh, mitigations for all raw hammer thresholds. Uh, and it incurs a small DM energy overhead over graphene and consumes less DM energy than Hydra. And for multi core workloads, the trends are still very similar. And uh, yeah. We have more analysis and results in the paper, starting with the security analysis of Comet. Uh, where we show that Comet prevents all row hammer bit collapse for all row hammer thresholds. Uh, we have a sensitivity analysis using a lot of design parameters and different design choices. Uh, we have uh, 
a performance evaluation under adversarial workloads. We have a comparison against relevant based mitigation techniques, and we already we also evaluate the performance at higher recovery thresholds. And you can check our paper for more results and analysis. Comet is open source and artifact evaluated, and you can check our report from that. Let me conclude my talk. So our goal is to prevent raw thermal bitfills with low area of performance and energy overheads in highly raw thermal vulnerable DRAM-based systems. Our key idea is to use low-cost and scalable hash-based counters to effectively track DRAM or activations. So this time we propose Comet. Comet tracks uh, most DRAM nodes with scalable hash-based counters by endpoint confiscation technique uh, to achieve a low area cost and tracks only a small set of DRAM nodes that are activated many times with highly accurate per DRAM or activation counters to reduce performance penalties. And our evaluation shows that uh, Comet achieves a good trade-off between area performance and energy cost, incurring significant less area overhead, and outperforming the state of the air mitigation techniques. And you can check that. Okay, so this was the paper presentation part. I can answer your questions if you have any. No questions? Okay, let's move on to the discussion part then. So I listed some strengths <laughs> for my own paper, which seems weird, but so raw hammer is an important robust feature in today's systems and it will likely be very important in uh, future systems as the young becomes more vulnerable. So this is a very relevant paper with a great goal. And Comet achieves a low area performance and energy cost of performing state of the art mitigation techniques. Uh, it has a comprehensive sensitivity analysis providing insights on the trade-offs in combining hash rates and hash rates counters. It has many results, many evaluations and analysis. So uh, basically it provides uh, the information on how to configure comments uh, for your own clients and needs. And the source code is available online, uh, which means that it can be tested, extended and improved uh, by anyone that wants to. And if you have any ideas, maybe you came up with another mitigation technique, you could uh, evaluate it using this and compare against Comet and other uh, mitigations that we implemented already. So yeah, I could notice that I didn't say well written, <laughs> but I think it's a clear paper, frankly. <laughs> I, I got a lot of help. <laughs> so yeah, we could give it a go, basically. And let's look at some bad examples for weaknesses. These are uh, some reviews that we got for this paper. Weaknesses, nothing comes to mind. I mean, it looks like it's good to receive it as a, as a review, uh, but basically you shouldn't do that. <laughs> or like some comments from authors like I'm small, uh, <laughs> which is good to receive, I guess, <laughs> depending on other reviews as well. But, but by the way, these are screenshots from the real reviews, like from yeah, the conferences. It's not really but I mean, this is like green to get these kind of reviews. Yeah, <laughs> but we shouldn't do that. I mean, it depends on all the context also, right? Oh, I cannot do anything to basically. I can hopefully mess up with time paper, like they will say I'm sold. <laughs> So usually, like with this, uh, along with this review, uh, you also have another reviewer complaining about and things, and then like uh, the guy who gave this review usually is not really like familiar with the paper enough to you know uh, argue back and champion the paper. So it's yeah. basically like it called nothing. Yeah. Okay. So I I listed some instances. Maybe you also came up with your own weaknesses. I'd be happy to hear them. Uh, basically, the first one is performance and energy overheads can potentially increase uh, for heavily memory intensive and most vulnerable. So, we presented actually some uh, results for that, right? So, when you look at the uh, raw hermit threshold of 100 to 85, you see that uh, basically the average performance overhead is not uh, prohibitively large, but it's uh, basically increase compared to graphene, right? Which we uh, sort of consider as one of the lowest performance uh, overheads out there for raw hammer mitigations. So this is because uh, comments in, uh, incur some track inaccuracy and therefore have uh, a higher performance overhead. And this is a challenge for low area cost mitigations that use shared counters. And this is the same with Hydra as well in this uh, Figure, you can see that both 
have a more performed solar as compared to graphene uh, when it comes to single part application results. And uh, this means that, so for the average case, maybe you don't have like a relatively large performance overhead, but maybe you have a special system that we know will execute a lot of heavily memory intensive applications all the time at the same time, then maybe you need to uh, configure Comet at design time to meet that requirements for that special system. And this could take some time. Well, you have some help from sensitivity analysis, but that might be one of the weaknesses when you consider the extreme cases. The second one is target attacks can potentially degrade performance by triggering frequent prevent refreshes. In the paper, we also uh, evaluate two types of uh, raw hammer attacks, one traditional raw hammer attack and some target attacks. So uh, the second one uh, basically has like two different uh, attacks targeting different low, low area cost mitigations that use shared counters, uh, basically aiming to stress them. So this is again a challenge for low area cost mitigations where you could have an attacker, uh, if they know that you have this sort of mitigation in the system, they could attack it to uh, basically degrade system performance. So that's one of the basically room for improvement places that we have in the paper. And lastly, uh, I think it, can, it could be useful to have an even more comprehensive security, sensitivity, sensitivity analysis focused more on multi-core workloads. You already have uh, some sensitivity analysis on multi-core workloads as well. Uh, it's not that, it's not like it's not in the paper, but we didn't test all our like configuration points with multi-core workloads because, because it takes a lot of time to evaluate those. And basically we didn't have that much time and this requires many hours, but I think it could reveal some insights uh, about how to configure comments uh, for uh, different workload mixes and so on. So that could be something that is missing from the paper uh, as is right now, but we're interested in extending. So these are all the things that I listed. Maybe you can speak up and say, oh, this paper sucks because of this. Poor writing. <laughs> Poor writing. <laughs> I'm sold. You're sold. <laughs> okay, good to hear. Um, I have some discussion points. So the first one is, what about scaling across multiple VRAM max? And if I leave it like this, it would be a bad uh, discussion point example, but let me tell you what I mean by this. So right now, country table and access legacy table are allocated or implemented for VRAM max. So that means that when we have multiple VRAM max, the area overhead increases. Uh, this is included in the area overhead uh, evaluation, but basically you can see that this uh, multiplies the area overhead when you have many, many VRAM packs, right? So the question is, how can we scale comment more efficiently for systems with many VRAM packs? Yes. Is this the same problem in other mechanisms as well, or only specific to comment? It is the same problem with other mechanisms that some of the other mechanisms that we have we evaluated. Uh, for example, graphene and Hydra also has had this problem uh, since they use counters to track. So they also implement per instance. Yes. An instance per bank. Yes. Okay. Any ideas? Okay, let me give you a hint. Uh, so let's say that we have a physical frame, we map it to the and we put the data in VRAM using uh, basically to a place uh, determined by the VRAM mapping. So in today's system, uh, there is one VRAM mapping uh, basically optimization or a, a type of VRAM mapping that we use is called uh, back interweaving that puts cache lines of a single page, uh, distributes it to uh, different VRAM banks, and basically places them in rows that have the same row ID, but across different VRAM banks. So can you think of uh, any result of this, like in terms of memory access patterns, or maybe in the context of row hammer, like what would be the activation cost of this? Different VRAM banks. Yes. Okay. There's a lot of, Pressure on these uh, 
uh, students because they're just a few. <laughs> so, okay, another thing then. Let's say that I have an application that streams through this page, uh, like accesses each cache line one time. And let's say that we only have like two cache lines that are pictured here. Um, what would be the act activation count of uh, these VMs? One, 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 right? Yes. So let's say that we have five, like we have a code that streams through five times. They will be all five. So do you think that it's necessary to have different counters for each of them? I mean, you can have multiple like, counter for multiple recovery, right? But I mean, you assuming the use in performance. Like in the sense of that, since you have to go to the more, you have more hash collisions. Stuff. Yes, yeah. yes, that's that's correct. So you mean like by sharing a counter across these different VRM nodes, you also introduce uh, another sort of like inaccuracy curious over there if the activation counts are different than each other. That's correct. And uh, basically, okay, I forgot about the simulation. Someone else looked into this. Uh, and we have another recent paper on this, uh, based on this observation. So we looked into a lot of uh, applications and see that the actual activation counts of these different VRM rows with the same row ID share, or like they have very close activation counts. And uh, we realize that we can combine, basically merge them to one, map them to only one uh, counter by also like putting some, um, Metadata over there to like understand which VRAM was accessed or not, and so on. So that paper uses that idea on graphene, uh, but it's like an optimization that we can uh, use for other mitigation based on activation counting, right? So one solution option is to combine comments with other things to basically reduce uh, that area overhead across multiple VRMs. Okay. So the second uh, discussion point, how can we improve multiple workload performance? Like I complained about it a lot, talked about the sources of it. Um, basically one main source of it is counter saturation, right? So um, basically you have, you are in incrementing a lot of counters and then uh, it creates this inaccuracy and basically increases the error margins in those counter values. So that's what causes the performs overhead for these workloads. Can you think of any way to, any like high level ideas of how to um, solve this? Wait, you say the problem with the multicore is that, like let's say multiple threads try to increase the counter at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So basically you, uh, you have like a lot of activations happening and Let's say that you're incrementing a lot of counters, you sort of end up incrementing all counters for a different VRAM row that is not active, right? Or maybe you are incrementing the minimum counter of another VRAM row, and then it reaches the threshold and causes a dramatic reflection. So that's like what that performance degradation comes from. So this is what we call counter saturation, sort of. Okay, more hints. So option one is to solve counter saturation. Like I said, it's like very high level. So to do so, first you need to determine that activation counters are saturated, right? After that, you can find a secure way to reset counters. So we have one, uh, basically a solution following this uh, steps, which is called urban random refresh and post granularity, which is explained in more detail in the paper, but uh, on high level, uh, what we do is we look at some statistics of these counter table and recent register table and uh, basically determine that our counters are saturated and we are prevent, like, preventing refresh in a lot of VRAM rows without actually the actual need to do so, or basically they are unnecessary. And then uh, we refresh all VRAM rows in a VRAM rank very aggressively and reset all counters. So you can see that that's like an aggressive solution because um, you are doing 
like a lot of refresh at the same time and DRAM becomes unavailable. So this has its own like trade of between unnecessary parameter refreshes and uh, basically coarse parameter to parameter refreshes. So that's one uh, solution to that. Uh, and maybe you can improve it by changing how it works or changing the parameters of how it works. Can you think of any optimizations? Again, very high level ideas could work also. Okay. Um, just to give up, like, give some ideas, uh, you could probably do this with finer granularity by determining counter groups, maybe. Uh, it could require some complications, some other maybe like ideas to understand which counters are saturated. Or maybe you could do this when DRAM is not utilized, right? Maybe DRAM is not busy and I can do this with uh, low performance overhead. And these could be implemented, basically. But when DRAM is not utilized, yeah, it's simply just have more counters. Um, you need to first refresh all DRAM rows to basically do that, yeah. You can do that. Okay. There is another option that I listed here. Do you have any other ideas, or you don't need to guess what I wrote there, but like any other ideas how to solve this problem? Maybe I can just show it. So you could scale the number of counters with the number of cores in the system. Uh, basically, this would reduce the load in each counter, right? So you would uh, track like um, all the rows with more counters and then distribute them evenly. And uh, basically, naively doing so uh, would increase the processor uh, chip area overhead, uh, but it could also like improve performance and energy overhead. Uh, and I think you could do even like smarter things here and. Maybe you do another sensitivity analysis on this and see like what happens if I scale with uh, the number of cores. Maybe I don't need that many counters for each core this time. And then uh, you can see like how that uh, works out. Maybe it could be achieved with low area overhead as well. Okay, I'm moving on to the next discussion. So what about row press? So row press is a recently discovered deep disturbance phenomenon that manifests as bit flips uh, in deep rows when you keep aggress rows open for long times. So this is different than row hammer because basically you don't hammer. So counting the act uh, activations uh, does not work as expected maybe. Can you think of any additions to comments or other mitigations? Uh, to basically cover for all press as well. I mean, you should check if uh, our flat is open because that's all the short of capacitor and the way to check whether the it's full and it has been open for a very long time and then you just refresh it. So that's yeah, yeah. the limits should be. Now, can you maybe like do that in the memory controller side? If I say yes, no, but you say no, then it's really obvious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just waiting you to the slide, the uh, last iteration, basically. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Basically, uh, right now we are supporting low row hammer thresholds uh, already, right? So, row press sort of reduces the hammer counts. Uh, the raw hammer threshold because now it just keeps the rows like open and then that creates bit flips. Uh, we already covered that case with Comet and like you said, uh, it would be sufficient to also account for the raw open time. So that's one solution. Like, uh, first we need to configure Comet for the correct raw hammer threshold and combine it with the memory control design that. Uh, limits how long a DRM row can be activated. So that sort of covers it. And the last discussion point. So what about in DRM row kind of mitigation? So let me give you some background. 
uh, DM manufacturers in Matt for hammer mitigation techniques, also uh, known as target draw refresh. And we don't have the full details of how these work. They are not uh, publicly discussed or shared. However, what we know is that they can refresh victim rows with no performance overhead for some low hammer thresholds by overlapping uh, the latency of prevent refreshes with other DM operations. So these sound good, right? So what about that? Um, what we also know is that recent research shows that custom attacks can bypass some of these uh, mitigations. So in contrast to that, some of this is completely secure. Let's say that you have or like a system that already employs this TRR uh, mechanism. Maybe you could also have comment, but in that case, you sort of need to know what TRR does, right? Because uh, it, it will activate or like refresh some roles, which ends up activating some roles, and then we need to count for them and so on. Yes. You said that uh, they overlap refresh to other operations in Europe. So you kind of have a motivation to refresh maybe roles that aren't even at your threshold yet, but maybe look at paper across the threshold. So simply avoiding in the future that you'll have to refresh them, not overlapping with any other near operation, right? Yeah, I think that's a solid idea. You could do that. If you knew which DM rows are getting closer to the threshold, right? Yes. How would you understand it? That's a, that's a different question. I mean, that's just a higher idea. Yeah, sure. I, I'm just trying to brainstorm. So you need to sort of uh, follow up with questions and presentation. <laughs> that's also another tip. I mean, it's <laughs> to make your function more. It's yeah. difficult because then you kind of have to track how often a counter or how quickly a counter increases, or maybe. Yeah. You could have like a second special right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Something like that. Maybe something smarter. Seems like there should be smarter options than thresholds. Okay. And in, in this field, actually, like solutions are not that smart usually. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I disagree. I think the hash solution is quite smart. So usually, like you, you come up with some smart solution in your mind, and then you just like simplify, simplify, simplify until it's just like actually count and <laughs> compare, <laughs> refresh. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess because the 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 So basically there, there are some useful things in, in the DRAM mitigations or even like support of uh, some mitigation from the DRAM side, right? Can you think of any other uh, basically useful things about uh, cooperating with DRAM devices? Well, one of them is, like you said, um, basically you have a chance to overlap some latencies. So that's one good thing, right? Can you think of any other uh, basically useful things? Any useful mitigation support or what? Yeah, from the DRAM side. Like, let's say that, to give you a hint, what would be something useful coming from the DRAM side to mitigate draw hammer? Uh, like, our perspective is that our mitigations are in the memory controller. Mm -hmm. I don't know in everything about DRAM at that level, right? So, my mitigation doesn't have a full picture of DRAM. Mm -hmm. And maybe DRAM device has its own. Information about how things work and stuff. Okay. Uh, one thing is that to identify victim roles for an IS role, this is very useful because right now uh, we sort of rely on uh, basically reverse engineering the locations of the roles because this uh, information is not public. We basically assume that we uh, know like which roles are victims of one IS role, but Basically, in DDI5, we have a DDI5 command uh, which can be used to report the address to the device for it to refresh the victims automatically, right? So, 
Uh, this could be very useful when you think of like uh, mitigations in the memory control, right? Where you don't know uh, which VR nodes are neighboring with which VR nodes and so on. So this could be one useful thing coming from the VR device stack. And the other one is that to overlap prevent refreshes with other operations or maybe like uh, global like refresh operations. Right? How can you overlap? So basically, if I can send like the AFM command uh, and let the device know that it already like with the TI, it already overlaps right with the periodic refresh. So this is what I want to do that. Mm. The EDR file command, the Mavanti ERM command, uh, reports victim rows for the request row, right? So, what it does is basically the memory controller tells the device this is an address to roll, uh -huh. and then the device refreshes the victim rows according to that address. So, it doesn't tell the memory controller yeah. that which rows are victim, but it, it just like performs refresh. Yeah, but yeah. regarding the like what is classified as a victim row? Because I mean, we have already seen pictures of MGP. Victim rows can become aggressive rows, right? Very good point. Yeah. Also, I remember that there was a graph that shows that the victim rows are of the distribution. So it might not be the adjacent rows, but it might be rows that are far away from the aggressive row. So how does DRFM, how is it able to identify that the victim row is a consequence of which aggressive row? So uh, basically, the device has that information about which like uh, roles are affected by activating one uh, DRAM role. So that that's what we assume at least. And, uh, so you, you put some faith on the manufacturer that you know they will do some proper testing, figure out like when you have a which role, which roles are being activated, so affected. So those are going to be the victim roles in that definition. Once you like from parental refresh to those victim roles or other accesses, they become aggressors and they have another set of victim roles. But I mean, still, it sounds very, very useful, right? I mean, in general, as we well, like, to get knowledge kind of from the physical location of the roles and etc. right? Yeah. Does it vary die to die or does it or does it like sign to design that uh, the, the victim role aggressor role deletions are constant? Yeah, so it's, it's, I don't know, do you want to answer? Yeah, sure. You can answer that. Okay. <laughs> I have an answer, but now it's like, he's the expert on that. I need to provide you the answer. <laughs> so it's basically based on design. Uh, so to make like, so basically inside the RAM chip, uh, ideally you should uh, use the whole space you have for like storage, right? Uh, like whatever area you're spamming for like peripheral circuitry or anything else, like it's, it's sort of wasted. Like it's headroom for improvement. So you want to simplify the design of raw, raw decoder circuitry, for example, or like other IO circuitries. And to do that, sometimes it makes sense to, you know, shuffle the raw addresses in a way that, you know, it will give you some optimizations basically. So that's one thing that they do in the design time that, you know, they, that they shuffle rows. Uh, and there's also another thing to uh, improve yield, meaning like uh, you already, already tape out some chips and some of them are broken because of the imperfections in the manufacturing process, right? Uh, and it's basically like wasted money. So you don't want to have that. You want to like, even some chips with defect, you want to sell them. And for that, basically, if in a bank you have like 64,000 uh, rows in design, they put like uh, a bunch of other extra rows so that uh, after the manufacturer, they do some test. And if it turns out that some of those rows are not working, they just like uh, reprogram the chip in a way that some row address will go to those extra rows. These are, they, those are called like spare rows or redundant rows. So uh, in the post-manufacturing, uh, they, they do that trick so that even the faulty chips are actually working. So they can sell them as well. Okay. But how do they restructure the row decoder such that it sends the input to a different output? Because the row decoder is like a map, right? Yes. So how does it restructure the, 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 the row decoder chip to chip such that uh, the same input causes a different output to a unused row? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know how they do that design actually. Yeah, but probably you can like uh, implement part of that decoder in a programmable way, right? I don't know. <laughs> do, do you have an idea? Also, now you mentioned that the road is more slightly more complex than Max, since you can send voltage, a custom voltage to to the road, to the word line, right? Like because the last time, because the Max you just pull the DDD and the road, whereas you mentioned in DDR4, um, there's a, you can customize the word line. Voltage. Yeah. So, road decoder basically like uh, just generates a signal about like which word line will be assaulted, right? And then that, uh, that signal goes to some other circuitry that actually like pushes the voltage to what right? Yeah. So it's, it's just like triggering on the technology transfer or something like that over there, right? And then, um, but it's like, a, I guess what you mentioned is about like where this power coming comes from, right? And it, uh, for that, yeah, so, uh, so in, internally in the DRAM chip, nothing is different actually because you have some power rail that provides VDD to some circuitry and you have also other additional power rail for like word lines. So even in DDR3, like word line voltage was larger than the like other circuitry because you, you need that like, voltage difference in the data source basically. Um, uh, the, the only difference is like in DDR3, uh, the, the high voltage was being generated internally, but in DDR4, they just like exposed to some pin and then like, okay, so you, yeah, it's actually like the job of the uh, motherboard or FPGA board, like the, the PCB basically to provide like uh, sufficient power to that rate. Uh, so you just like inject the voltage from externally to, to the rear. Yes, yes. So, what was the last discussion for the live panel? And uh, if you have anything to add, comments. <laughs> okay. Yes. I guess this is the end of session, right? Uh, Lenny, yeah. do we need to make any announcements at the end of the session or should we just? Okay. See you everyone last week, next week. <laughs>